So if I could have the panel join me on stage, please, and we'll get some lights on up here. Thanks for sticking around. Um, come on up. Just sit anywhere and grab a microphone, and they do better when they're not in the stand. <clears throat> we'll get a light on the stage in a minute. Boy, I had a lump in my throat throughout that movie. I've seen it a couple of times, but it feels emotional, <laughs> especially the night of a presidential debate, I think. Um, so let me introduce oh everyone to you. Um, we have here Steve Cavendish, who's the editor of Nashville City Paper. He's moderating our discussion tonight. Thank you very much, Steve, for being with us. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Sachin Chetta, who is here from Milwaukee. He's the National Engagement Director for As Goes Janesville. And um, he's just so great to come down to Nashville to be here for this screening. He's doing a few meetings in town to try to get some conversations going on between um, business and labor people. Um, we're showing the film, by the way, tomorrow uh, morning at the Martha O'Brien Center for people who live in the James Casey homes and having a conversation about the issues in this film. So looking forward to that, Sachin. Thanks for being here. We have Tom Negri, who is the managing director of the Lowe's Vanderbilt Hotel. Welcome, Tom. And we have Caroline Blackwell, who is the um, director of the Metro um, Human Relations Commission. Thank you for being here, Caroline. And we have Richard Lloyd, who is a professor of sociology at Vanderbilt, who specializes in urban um, sociology. Thank you for being here. And we have Dan Cornfield, who is also a professor of sociology at Vanderbilt, who specializes in labor issues. So, so happy to have all of you here. This is a, a real treat to have this group. So thanks for being here. Steve, I'll let you take it away. I have the mic for questions from the audience, so if you want to jump in, just raise your hand. Sure, thanks. Thank you. uh, and it, I guess uh, we, let's start out by coming this way across the panel and talking about kind of just your initial impression of the film and some of the issues that it raised. This is a, <clears throat> a truly uh, powerful uh, documentary about uh, a profound uh, class warfare uh, in the United States and a very strong business attack on uh, working families. And it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's racialized at the same time. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, truly struck by the, the different fates of the, uh, the two families, the, the white business family and the African-American uh, uh, factory family and uh, how the whole point of uh, quote unquote economic development from one perspective was family togetherness and a future together and the other point was the, the working family getting the brunt of the change and being torn apart. If you guys can grab the mic out of the stand it sounds better from our end if that's okay. <laughs> Like, like the members of the audience, I was unable to pre-screen the film, and in some ways I feel like I'm still processing. Um, there was a lot of familiarity, though, having gone to school, as my colleague did, on the south side of Chicago, uh, the sort of ways in which communities, and once vibrant communities, such as Chicago south side, have been punished. And so there's a degree that, yeah, that this is not breaking news. You know, there's been a slow decline. Um, that's been unfolding now over decades. I was reminded without the rabbits of Michael Moore's breakout film, Roger and Me, which was set in Flint, set in Flint Michigan. Um, and so we've seen progressive disempowerment of organized labor with the mobility of capital. One of the things I think is also interesting that I'm, I'm thinking about, and I'm looking forward to hearing from people who are closer to the ground in Wisconsin, was watching the Republican convention and what big stars, Scott Walker and now the vice presidential nominee, Paul Ryan are from that state. And I'm interested in thinking about who their constituencies are in the state and what their vision is. Um, as much as I'd like to be grateful for the recent Good Jobs report, one thing I think is worth noting about the jobs that have been coming back in the recovery that I think is illustrated fairly powerfully here is that they tend to be 
people losing middle income jobs and getting back low income jobs. So in these kinds of recessions, even when the recovery happens, you're seeing a real drop in the wage and standard of living of ordinary workers uh, who are, as the film indicated, increasingly bereft of effective representation, which is taking nothing away from the commitment of union leaders or liberal leaders. Um, but they are in a position where they have been disempowered through this uh, recession and through restructuring of the United States industrial economy, including, by the way, significant movement further south than just Fort Wayne, Indiana. So movement to the American South, which is already got the Walker dream accomplished in terms of right to work uh, legislation and management of public sector unions. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about, I guess the other thing worth, I, I suppose then, that I'm curious about, I was galvanized as many people were by the response in the State House from the left and the energy there. But the Tea Party, who was energized by the election of Barack Obama, has managed to effectively, despite the fact that they're really not popular with the national electorate, to get Paul Ryan as a vice presidential nominee, to have Scott Walker, as a prominent figure in the Republican National Convention uh, to insert themselves into Republican electoral politics very effectively. And with things like Occupy Wall Street, other austerity motivated measures, you do not see the translation into political representation in the Democratic Party. So I wonder what's happened in Wisconsin since 2010, since the recall. Um, to sort of institutionalize the left response, because Walker actually won easily uh, in the recall election. Caroline. Thank you. Um, I come from a small town, a um, small city in Connecticut, Danbury, Connecticut, um, along the 128 corridor that experienced um, a very similar kind of exodus of um, skilled labor um, and has left that part of um, the United States really bereft of jobs for um, folks who had typically worked in factories either on factory lines or um, doing some of the unskilled kinds of work that um, or even skilled labor as it was represented in the um, GM plant. Um, this story I was really surprised about how much it affected me because I can go home um, today and see the outcome of that, the um, exacerbated division between those who have and those who have not, um, the kinds of changes that it's meant for families. And so I'm really thinking a lot about um, the families um, and the differences and the disparate outcomes for the families um, uh, that we saw in this particular movie. I'm also struck by a couple of lines that I heard in the movie. One of them was, when the um, governor talked about dividing and conquering. And I think that we all need to pay attention to that message um, and that it costs $45 million to reelect him. And um, at the same time, there's been a pulling back of basic services and human services that support um, those who really are um, hurting the most and, and need the most um, in our country. So dividing and conquering in $45 million, a $60 million campaign, it's um, obscene in my opinion. Tom? Thank you. It looks as if I'm probably the only business guy leader up here. No, you want a business, that's good. Well, I, I feel, I gotta tell you, I'm totally depressed. I watch that movie and go, oh my God, that can't be me. Um, and, and, I, and I really don't think it's me, and I don't think it's our community, and I don't think it's our state, and I, and I think we've proved it before, and we can do it again, and if we, if we talk with one voice and not have a divide and conquer. Um, and I think that's very, very important. And I think we've done that in our city before, and we're doing that in our state. We, we have Nashville for all of us. We had a meeting this afternoon uh, where we have business leaders and unions and, and clergy sitting down and discussing these issues. Um, and we've discussed these issues before, and to see what that movie portrays is, is an oh my God. I, I want you to know I'm a progressive independent. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is, but that's what I am, all right? And, uh, and I feel really good about that. And I feel good about that because I'm able to speak to both sides, and there should not be sides. 
and, and, and I think we've changed over the past eight, 10 years, and I've been in Nashville for 15. Uh, and I've been in the hospitality business for 37 years, and I started it as an hourly employee. Uh, and I'm proud of that. Uh, and I'm proud of you know, where we stand in my hotel, for example. Um, I can tell you the hour hourly wage, without telling you the hourly wage, but I can tell you the hourly wage is averages over $17 an hour plus benefits. Um, and that's a pretty good deal uh, in what is the hospitality business, and it can be that way. Uh, we have less turnover than any other hotel in the state. I'm very proud of that, and one of the lowest turnovers of any hotel in Lowe's. And I think that has to do with that conversation, and we have to have that conversation not only in business, uh, not only in the boardroom, but in the community as a whole. And I could talk for an hour and a half, but I'll pass it on. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, for, for being here and uh, for having me in, in Nashville. It's really a great pleasure to be traveling around the country, talking to people about the film and the reactions to the film. Um, I hope as the conversation continues that I get a chance, Richard, to answer some of your specific questions about Wisconsin. That's where I live, and I lived through uh, just about everything that happened in the film. I was at some of those rallies, uh, and... Uh, I saw you. Yeah, <laughs> I was right behind Jesse Jackson. No, uh, l let me say two things, though, kind of an interest. One is this film didn't start um, at all as a movie about uh, politics or about... Um, even division to some degree. It started as a movie in 2009 about how this community was reacting to this existential challenge around a plant closing that employed directly or indirectly something like 20% of the wage earners uh, in the county. Um, and the natural consequence of the political fight was that everybody in the movie engaged in it. They uh, were either at a rally or uh, testifying at hearings. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of ways that the, the characters interacted with that fight. And so it was impossible to finish the movie and make the movie without talking about the political fight that happened. Um, but the second thing that I want to say is that I still believe, and I, I know all of these characters. Um, I have met them all. Um, the one I know the least uh, is Mary. But even um, with her, I, I think that they're all very sincere in wanting to accomplish whatever it is their goals are. And, and she works tirelessly um, without pay. On top, I mean, she gets paid to be a bank president, but uh, she volunteers her time at Rock County 5.0 and, and countless things in the community. Um, but the challenge is bigger than kind of what any of the individuals do. And the challenge is the division itself. Um, and I've only been in Nashville for a day uh, today, uh, but I've had a lot of conversations with folks about how people here seem to be working together. And when this movie started, there was this golden moment in Janesville because there was tremendous unity around trying to save the G GM plant. Um, Tim Cullen was the, one of the co-chairs. There was another guy who was a co-chair who was a business leader. Um, you had Republicans and Democrats working together, let's save this plant, let's save these jobs. And when that effort failed, when GM made the decision that a plant that built really big SUVs wasn't going to be a priority going into this kind of post-recession era, um, everybody retreated to their ideological encampments. And they did what you do kind of at the extremes of politics. Um, and so we hope that that comes out in the movie, right? And that the result of that then, we hope, in the conversation is, how can we do this better? That as sincere as people are, and as much as they're, they're facing the challenges that they're facing, how can we address the economic challenges. And that doesn't obviously get into the larger issues around trade or tax policy or you know, economic policy writ large. There's a hundred issues we could talk about. Uh, but we do want to uh, hopefully see that you know, these folks can inspire us, um, as sad and depressing as the film can be at times, to see the challenges that they're facing, uh, to try to do a better job, to improve the economic development efforts, to improve the community engagement efforts that are happening all over the country. because. This isn't just a movie about Janesville, it's a movie about America and what we're facing, as Richard said, in an economy that is not creating higher wage jobs the way that it's creating lower wage jobs. Excuse me, before you ask the next question, Steve, just a, just a time check. Um, this clock is right, and um, so, you know, it, it, I know that seems incredible that we're getting that close, but maybe like 10 minutes. Sure. And we'll sure. Um, one of the things that, that struck me uh, about the movie was 
the polarization uh, and, and that we saw in Wisconsin. And I think we've seen a lot of that in Tennessee um, in, in, our, in our politics over the last few years. Um, was, there any, was there anything in terms of tone that, that people saw that, that they saw a parallel with here uh, in terms of rhetoric or in terms of the, the level of commitment to an ideology? Um, because I, I, thought that, I thought that there were certain things which played out in a, in a sort of a, in sort of a kind of a universal way for our politics right now. Sure, go ahead, Dan. In the last uh, couple of years, there has been an effort to uh, weaken the uh, labor movement in Tennessee, and the, the biggest example of that would be the teachers and the changing state laws to uh, reduce collective bargaining in Tennessee, which occurred pretty much right at the same time that the Wisconsin effort to defeat public sector unionism was uh, taking place. Uh, there was an effort, a similar effort, last year with state employees here um, as well. Um, we have a mayor in our city that sort of holds up the idea that Nashville is a place where everyone ought to be involved. And one of the things that I didn't see here was that kind of leadership, leadership that said, um, we really need to care, we need to develop economically. No one could be a, more, a stronger advocate for economic development than Carl Dean. Um, at the same time, he also stands up and says um, on a regular basis that we have to care for people, we have to make our schools better, we have to provide um, support services for people, so there's a message of compassion and concern as well as economic development and growth. And if I, if I may, I, first of all, those two women make me hate economic development. You know, I mean, it really, wow, bummer. Because if that's economic development, I don't want to be part of it, all right? So I want to make that point. The, the other point I want to make is now is the time to be involved. It's not yesterday. It's today. It's not tomorrow, it's today. If we don't want to see what's happening happen in the state of Tennessee, now's the time that you speak to your business leaders and don't let that happen, all right? You go into the boardroom, you go into the Chamber of Commerce and you say, this is why we shouldn't have this happen. We shouldn't have, it, uh, uh, we shouldn't have politics erode the benefits of our educators. It just shouldn't happen. And if it is, we've got to speak up and we've got to do it today because people will listen. Those folks sitting in that boardroom, I've experienced it, I see it, I see it on a daily basis. They're not experiencing what the hourly wage earner experiences. They just don't get it. And I don't, that's, that's about as frank as I can be, all right? Uh, you know, they're going from their homes in Bell Mead or somewhere in Williamson County, I live in Williamson County, and they're driving to work and they're not getting it. And they're not getting it because maybe they forgot. Maybe they forgot 10, 15 years ago or where they were and how they got there. Maybe that's the case. Maybe they have to have that return of investment. But folks, now's the time to sit down at the table and have that conversation. If I could just say one thing, it's, you know, I think that the, a couple of you have, have pointed out, there is a level of just not getting it, right? That if you have a, a, a economic development partnership or group, that says, hey, we can pay them less, they're all gone anyway, um, we can recruit higher wage you know, people to come in and buy bigger houses. It doesn't address the critical need of a community. When 11,000 people lose their jobs because of the direct and indirect costs of, of losing a major plant, most of those folks live right in that community. They're collecting unemployment until they can't. Maybe they're collecting retirement or disability, but their overall income is a lot lower. And it, it's hard to sustain that middle class. You can't do it just by high wage jobs. You can't do it just by high tech. We have a middle class in this country that has depended upon not unskilled, but lower skilled, less training. Um, and even a retraining system is going to only work for those who are able to really meet those challenges. And I think Cindy is an exceptional person. I know her. Um, you know, she passed that board exam, but she also was in the military and passed basic training. She also has the drive that you see in the film. She also has the intellectual and you know, wisdom capacity 
to succeed at a complete job change from slinging tire rims to giving shots as a lab tech. And I, if that's the expectation that we have for the middle class, that every 10 or 20 years, that all of us are gonna make those types of transitions, that's not a sustainable way to build an economy. And so our argument would be that you have to engage those people facing those challenges as part of the process so that you know that the solutions that are being proposed really are gonna work for the broadest set of people, which unfortunately, um, you know, sometimes these politically divisive moves, just they don't work for enough people. And that's why the statistics in Wisconsin, in our view over the last three years, haven't been very good because we don't have a strategy that is uh, affecting the broadest range of people. Let me, let me ask a quick question and then uh, I wanna throw it open to anybody who has questions here. Um, is there any political benefit though to that kind of compromise? I mean, I, I think you've seen I think certainly we've seen here in Tennessee that there are that there are political perils to uh, reaching across the aisle. I think there were certainly several several primary races this last cycle where uh, people uh, candidates were primaried because uh, because they were perceived as uh, dealing with the other party. Uh, is that, I understand everybody's uh, kind of belief in compromise, but at the same time, uh, aren't the parties at, 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 at fault here for kind of fostering this sort of, this sort of willingness to eat their own? Absolutely. I, I mean, it's absolutely the case. You know, the idea that we're allowing either end of the spectrum here, and, and specifically the right end of the spectrum. To have the control it has is not good. All right. And we have to be able to, to speak up uh, and we have to be able to fund that. You can't just sit here and say, oh my God, look what happened. All right. We have to be able to write a check. We have to be that voice that says, hey, wait a second, let's take a step into the middle. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that in a lot of areas. And when someone does do that, they're not finding the support needed. So it's really important. And can I just say in Wisconsin, it's definitely not just the right. If you are, I mean, uh, Tim, who at, at some level looks like the hero in this movie, right, um, is not particularly popular amongst the leadership in the left and the Democrats in, in Wisconsin because he is the guy in the middle always trying to cut the deal. Um, and the state did work better. We grew jobs faster. Our, we grew incomes faster, we had less unemployment, we had a stronger education system, when we had a polity that was more interested in compromise. We had a Republican governor for uh, you know, 16 years, um, and lots of stuff got done. Schools got funded at a higher level, and a lot of things happened because they had a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's just the right. I think that that challenge is um, whenever you have uh, uh, extreme politics. Oh, just so, maybe I misheard you. Yeah. Both ends of the spectrum. Right. It's both ends of the spectrum. Right now we see control at one end of the spectrum, but we both, everybody's gotta take that step in uh, because without that step and without the other side, whatever side that is being heard, uh, we're not gonna have that compromise. We're not gonna be able to sit at the same table. I lived in Wisconsin for three or four years. One of my children's were, children was born there. And it seems to me that I recall that um, it actually had a socialist history, at least in Milwaukee, and there was a huge, there was a huge sense of commitment to caring for public service and, and all of those kinds of things that it's interesting now does wanna, not seem to exist. I don't want to cut you guys off, but I do want to let anybody who wants to ask a question uh, of the panel uh, ask something. Yep. So a lot of these efforts in Wisconsin and elsewhere to uh, limit public employees' collective bargaining rights and cut back their wages, I think are mounted ostensibly to tackle budget deficits, soaring budget deficits. But also I think uh, a part of it is to um, basically uh, enfeeble the Democratic Party, uh, whose political power in 2008 was very much harnessed by uh, public employee unions. Do you think uh, efforts uh, such as Governor Walker's and other Republican governors across the country um, to limit these rights really pays uh, electoral dividends? Is it really gonna make a difference in, um, 
and electoral politics. Along, along those lines, uh, I, I did question the sincerity of the budget cutting uh, philosophy of the Republicans in this scenario, <clears throat> so much so that I checked the unemployment rates from the US Department of Labor for Rock County before coming here tonight. And in fact, uh, uh, in March of 2009, about a month after the passage of the Federal Stimulus Act, um, the, the Rock County unemployment rate was 14%. It was pretty high. <clears throat> It just went straight down to today, where it's about 8.6%. That was without Rock 5.0. And what the documentary kind of understates is the federal context of the recovery that has occurred and the Republican effort to not really acknowledge that and to use an, an alternate uh, philosophy to suggest that it's uh, still going on and it, only through enterprising behavior and not government can we uh, get out of this mess. Just very quickly, Cynthia's program was federally funded. So I don't know if that was clear. Sure. There used to be a caption, we may have lost that, but so her retraining program, which found, she was able to find a job, was through a federally funded retraining program. So I hate to cut us off, but I think we, just to give everybody a chance to watch, to, to get in there to see the debate, she said she doesn't have a question, but Sachin, uh, Sachin could you close us out? Is there anything you wanna say at the end of this discussion? Well, let me just uh, try to answer uh, kind of one of Richard's questions. So, you know, well, first of all, what the gentleman said is, is absolutely true, that, that mathematically what happened in terms of the, the attack on public employees, and I think this is, listen, I'm on one side of this thing, but I'll, I'll tell you that objectively that the math wasn't about cutting the budget, it was about um, defunding public employee unions. Um, they cut taxes as much as they were saving in terms of the, the wage and benefit costs. Um, and, and really it was about, you know, kind of public pensions and long-term costs. It, you weren't really saving anything on the front end, um, you know, the way, the way that the, the, the budget actually works. Um, but you did defund public employee unions. So the state teachers union is selling their building and is at something like 15% of their previous membership. You know, most of the municipal uh, unions are down to a fraction of their previous size. Um, so what we have to do then is, is figure out um, how do you take the politics of the day and, and move to the next step? And I think in Wisconsin, we haven't done that, right? I mean, I th and, and I think, Richard, this kind of goes to, to your question that, um, and maybe I want you to restate your, your question, but, you know, th this election was um, hopefully unrepeatable. Uh, the, the numbers really kind of understate what happened. You know, the, the 45 million is just what Walker spent and doesn't count all the, the independent money that was spent you know, so it was actually about 70 million. The 20 million on the other side includes the Democratic primary for who was gonna be the gubernatorial candidate. So it overstates what was spent on the Democratic side in terms of the actual fight against Walker. Um, and, and so, you know, would the result have been the same? Um, probably not in an evil fight, maybe an equal fight. He might have, he might have won, but it wouldn't have been as, as clear. The Democrats have taken the Senate back through these recalls, right? So the recalls had an impact the gubernatorial recall didn't change who was in charge. But what has happened is that the government is essentially shut down and is just waiting for the next step because divided government doesn't work anymore in Wisconsin. It used to work, right? It used to be you could have one House Democratic and the other Republican and they'd cut a deal and they'd figure out a way to get each each's priorities addressed. Now they just don't do anything and they're just waiting it out to see how who's gonna have one party control again. Um, and so it, it, it's a very, um, damaged dynamic in terms of the civil and political culture in Wisconsin. And I think one of the things we're hoping to do through the movie is in telling the stories of the people and how it affects the people, try to go find a way to solve that, right? Through um, hopefully finding some examples in cities like Nashville or Columbus, Ohio, that's got a great example of how Democrats and Republicans are working together. Um, and then say, okay, how do we bring that to communities in Wisconsin or in other places around the country that are having these same challenges. And, and I'm hoping that um, this screening isn't the only screening that we have. Uh, there's actually a feature length version of the movie. This was a 53 minute version. There's an 85 minute version of the movie. And we hope to be back in the next three or four months to have another screening and to continue to build the partnerships and the conversations so we can figure out how to get to the next step. And it won't be on a night where there's a presidential debate that everybody wants to go watch. 
Thank you so much. Um, please join us um, to watch the debate. I'm sorry to cut you off. I could listen to you all talk all night. But um, So the d debate, Renaissance Hotel in the Bridge Lounge, if the fourth floor of the garage goes straight over to that bridge, if you would care to join us, um, we'll be there in a minute. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Very good.